Welcome to the Jesuits by James Wiley. We're continuing to read at page 17 for this reading. This Reformation MP3 audio resource is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. Many free Puritan and Reformed resources, as well as our complete online catalog containing classic and contemporary Reformation books, digital downloads, MP3s, videos, DVDs, CDs, and the Puritan hard drive at great discounts are on the web at puritandownloads.com. Also, please consider, pray, and act upon the important truths found in the following quotation by Charles Spurgeon, quote, As the Apostle says to Timothy, so also he says to everyone, Give yourself to reading. He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves that he has no brains of his own. You need to read. Renounce as much as you will all light literature, but study as much as possible sound theological works, especially the Puritanic writers and expositions of the Bible. The best way for you to spend your leisure is to be either reading or praying. End of quote. If you'd like to be added to our email list, please send an email to swrb at swrb.com with the word add in the subject line. Our email list is a double opt-in list, so once you've sent us your email address, you'll be asked by email to confirm that you want to join our list using the email address you've supplied. Your email information will be kept confidential, and you can easily remove yourself from our email list by simply emailing us at swrb at swrb.com with the word remove in the subject line. Once you're on our email list, you'll be alerted to the all-new free Reformation resources, free MP3s, free electronic books and texts, and so forth, that SWRB makes available on the web, as well as, at times, to our best discounts and super specials. We also encourage you to reproduce this audio resource and to pass it on to your friends, but we only authorize this as long as the full contents of the message, including the header and trailer, is not altered in any way, and as long as the audio file is given away for free. And now to SWRB's reading of The Jesuits by James Wiley, which we hope you find to be a great blessing, and which we pray draws you nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him. John 14:6. Well, as I said, we're on page 17. The coadjutors are divided into temporal and spiritual. The temporal coadjutor is never admitted into holy orders. Such are retained to minister in the lowest offices. They become college cooks, porters, or purveyors. For these and similar purposes, it is held expedient that they should be lovers of virtue and perfection, and content to serve the society in the careful office of a Martha. The spiritual coadjutor must be a priest of adequate learning, that he may assist the society in hearing confessions and giving instructions in Christian doctrine. It is from among the spiritual coadjutors that the rectors of colleges are usually selected by the general. It's a further privilege of theirs that they may be assembled in congregation to deliberate with the professed members in matters of importance, but no vote is granted them in the election of a general. Having passed with approbation the many stringent tests to which he is here subjected in order to perfect his humility and obedience, and having duly deposited in the exchequer of the society whatever property he may happen to possess, the spiritual coadjutor, if a candidate for the highest grade, is admitted to the uh, oblation of his vows, which are similar in form and substance to those he's already taken, with this exception, that they assign to the general the place of God. I promise, so runs the oath, to the omnipotent God, in presence of his virgin mother, and of all the heavenly hierarchy, and to thee, Father General of the Society of Jesus, holding the place of God, and so forth. With this oath sworn on its threshold, he enters the inner circle of the society, 
and is enrolled among the professed. The professed members constitute the society par excellence. They alone know its deepest secrets, and they alone wield its highest powers. But perfection in Jesuitism cannot be reached otherwise than by the loss of manhood. Will, judgment, conscience, liberty, all the Jesuit lays down at the feet of his general. It's a tremendous sacrifice, but to him the general is God. He now takes his fourth or peculiar vow in which he binds himself to go without question and delay or repugnance to whatever region of the earth and on whatever errand the Pope may be pleased to send him. This he promises to the omnipotent God and to his general holding the place of God. The wisdom, justice, righteousness of the command he is not to question. He is not even to permit his mind to dwell upon it for a moment. It is the command of his general, and the command of his general is the precept of the Almighty. His superiors are over him in the place of the divine majesty. In not fewer than 500 places in the Constitution, says uh, Mr. Chalotes, are expressions used similar to the following, quote, We must always see Jesus Christ in the general, be obedient to him in all his behests, as if they came directly from God himself, and so forth. When the command of the superior goes forth, the person to whom it is directed is not to stay till he has finished the letter his pen is tracing, say the constitutions. He must give instant compliance so that holy obedience may be perfect in us in every point, in execution, in will, in intellect. Obedience is styled the tomb of the will, a blessed blindness which causes the soul to see the road to salvation. And the members of the society are taught to immolate their will as a sheep <clears throat> is sacrificed. The Jesuit is to be in the hands of his superior, as the axe is in the hands of the woodcutter, or as a staff is in the hands of an old man which serves him wherever and in whatever thing he is pleased to use it. In fine, the constitutions enjoin that they who live under obedience shall permit themselves to be moved and directed under divine providence by their superiors just as if they were a corpse, which allows itself to be moved and handled in any way. The annals of mankind do not furnish another example of a despotism so finished. We know of no other instance in which the members of the body are so numerous or the ramifications so wide, and yet, the centralization and cohesion so perfect. We have traced at some length the long and severe discipline which every member must undergo before being admitted into the select class that by way of eminence constitute the society. Before arriving on the threshold of the inner circle of Jesuitism, three times has the candidate passed through that terrible ordeal, first as a novice, secondly as a scholar, thirdly as a coadjutor. Is his training held to be complete when he is admitted among the professed? No. A fourth time must he undergo the same dreadful process. He is thrown back again into the crucible and kept amid its fires till pride and obstinacy and self-will and love of ease, till judgment, soul, and conscience have all been purged out of him. And then he comes forth, fully refined, completely attempered and hardened, a vessel fully fitted for the use of his general. Prepared to execute with a conscience that never remonstrates his most terrible command and to undertake with a will that never rebels the most difficult and dangerous enterprises he may assign him. In the words of an eloquent writer, talk of drilling and discipline? Why, the drilling and the discipline which gave to Alexander the men that marched in triumph from Macedon to the Indus, uh, to Caesar the men that marched in triumph from Rome to the wilds of Caledonia, to Hannibal the men that marched in triumph from Carthage to Rome, to Napoleon, the men whose achievements surpassed in brilliance the united glories of the soldiers of Macedon, of Carthage, and of Rome, and to Wellington, the men who smote into the dust the very flower of Napoleon's chivalry. Why, 
The drilling and the discipline of all these combined cannot, in point of stern, rigid, and protracted severity, for a moment be compared to the drilling and discipline which fitted and molded men for becoming full members of the militant institute of the Jesuits. Such Loyola saw was the core <clears throat> that was needed to confront the armies of Protestantism and turn back the advancing tide of light and liberty. Touched with a divine fire, the disciples of the gospel attained at once to a complete renunciation of self and a magnanimity of soul which enabled them to brave all dangers and endure all sufferings and to bear the standard of a recovered gospel over deserts and oceans in the midst of hunger and pestilence of dungeons and racks and fiery stakes. It was vain to think of overcoming warriors like these unless by combat combatants of an equal temper and spirit and Loyola set himself to fashion such. He could not clothe them with the panoply of light. He could not inspire them with that holy and invincible courage which springs from faith nor could he be so able to enkindle their souls with the love of the Savior and the joys of the life eternal as that they should despise the sufferings of time. But he could give them their counterfeits. He could enkindle them with fanaticism, inspire them with a Luciferian ambition, and so pervert and indurate their souls by evil maxims and long and rigorous training that they should be insensible to shame and pain and would welcome suffering and death. Such were the weapons of the men he sent forth to the battle. Chapter 4. The Moral Code of the Jesuits. Probabilism and so forth. We have not yet surveyed the full and perfect equipment of those troops which Loyal, excuse me, Loyola sent forth to prosecute the war against Protestantism. Nothing was left unthought of and unprovided for, which might assist them in covering their opponents with defeat, crowning themselves with victory. They were set free from every obligation, whether imposed by the natural or the divine law. Every stratagem, Artifice and disguise were lawful to men in whose favor all distinction between right and wrong had been abolished. They might assume as many shapes as Proteus and exhibit as many colors as the chameleon. They stood apart and alone among the human race. First of all, they were cut off from country. Their vow bound them to go to whatever land their general might send them and to remain there as long as he might appoint. Their country was the society. They were cut off from family and friends. Their vow taught them to forget their father's house and to esteem themselves wholly only when every affection and desire which nature had planted in their breasts had been plucked up by the roots. They were cut off from property and wealth. For although the society was immensely rich, its individual members possessed nothing nor could they cherish the hope of ever becoming personally wealthy, seeing they had taken a vow of perpetual poverty. If it chanced that a rich relative died and left them his heirs, the general relieved them of their vow and sent them back into the world for so long a time as might enable them to take possession of the wealth of which they had been named the heirs. But this done, they returned, laden with their booty, and resuming their vow as Jesuits, laid every penny of their newly acquired riches at the feet of the general. They were cut off, moreover, from the state. They were discharged from all civil and national relationships and duties. They were under a higher code than the national one. The institutions, namely, which Loyola had edited and the Spirit of God had inspired, and they were the subjects of a higher monarch and the sovereign of the nation, their own general. Nay, more, the Jesuits were cut off even from the Pope, for if their general held the place of the omnipotent God, much more did he hold the place of his vicar. And so was it, in fact, 
For soon the members of the Society of Jesus came to recognize no laws but their own. And though at their first formation they professed to have no end but the defense and glory of the papal see, it came to pass, when they grew to be strong, that instead of serving the tiara, they compelled the tiara to serve the society and made their own wealth, power, and dominion the one grand object of their existence. They were a papacy within the papacy, a papacy whose organization was more perfect, whose instincts were more cruel, whose workings were more mysterious, and whose dominion was more destructive than that of the old papacy. So stood the Society of Jesus. A deep and wide gulf separated it from all other communities and interests. Set free from the love of family, from the ties of kindred, from the claims of country, and from the rule of law, careless of the happiness they might destroy and the misery and pain and woe they might inflict, the members were at liberty, without control or challenge, to pursue their terrible end, which was the dethronement of every other power, the extinction of every other interest but their own, and the reduction of mankind into abject slavery, that on the ruins of the liberty, the virtue, and the happiness of the world they might raise themselves to supreme, unlimited dominion. But we have not yet detailed all the appliances with which the Jesuits were careful to furnish themselves for the execution of their unspeakably audacious and diabolical design. In the midst of these abysses, there opens to our eye a yet profounder abyss. To enjoy exemption from all human authority and from every earthly law was to them a small matter. Nothing would satisfy their lust for license save the entire abrogation of the moral law. And nothing would appease their pride save to trample underfoot the majesty of heaven. We now come to speak of the moral code of the Jesuits. The keynote of their ethical code is the famous maxim that the end sanctifies the means. Before that maxim, the eternal distinction of right and wrong vanishes. Not only do the stringency and sanctions of human law dissolve and disappear, but the authority and majesty of the Decalogue are overthrown. There are no conceivable uh, crime, villainy, and atrocity which this maxim will not justify. Nay, such become dutiful and holy, provided which the Jesuit means the honor, interest, and advancement of his society. In short, the Jesuit may do whatever he has a mind to do, all human and divine laws notwithstanding. This is a very grave charge, but the evidence of its truth is unhappily too abundant, and the difficulty lies in making a selection. What the popes have attempted to do by the plenitude of their power, namely to make sin to be no sin, the Jesuit doctors have done by their casuistry. Quote, the first and great commandment in the law, end of quote, said the same divine person who proclaimed it from Sinai, is to love the Lord thy God. Well, the Jesuit casuists have set men free from the obligation to love God. Escobar collects the different sentiments of the famous divines of the Society of Jesus upon the question, when is a man obliged to have actually an affection for God? And the following are some of those. Suarez says, It is sufficient a man love him before he dies, not assigning any particular time. Vasquez, that it is sufficient even at the point of death. Others, when a man receives his baptism. Others, when he is obliged to be contrite. Others, upon holidays. But our father Castro Palau disputes all these opinions, and that justly. Hurtado de Mendoza pretends that a man is obliged to do it once every year. Our father Koninck uh, believes a man to be obliged once in three or four years. Henriquez, once in five years. Filiusius affirms it to be probable that in rigor a man is not obliged every five years. What then? He leaves the point to the wise. 
We are not, says Father Sermon, so much commanded to love him as not to hate him. Thus do the Jesuit theologians make void the first and great commandment in the law. The second commandment in the law is thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The second great commandment meets with no more respect at the hands of the Jesuits than the first. Their morality dashes both tables of the law in pieces. Charity to man, it makes void equally with the love of God. The methods by which this may be done are innumerable. The first of these is termed probabilism. This is a device which enables a man to commit any act, be it ever so manifest a breach of the moral and divine law, without the least restraint of conscience, remorse of mind, or guilt before God. What is probabilism? By way of answer, we shall suppose that a man has a great mind to do a certain act, of the lawfulness of which he is in doubt. And he finds that there are two opinions upon the point, the one probably true to the effect that the act is lawful, the other more probably true to the effect that the act is sinful. Under the Jesuit regimen, the man is at liberty to act upon the probable opinion. The act is probably right, but more probably wrong. Nevertheless, he is safe in doing it in virtue of the doctrine of probabilism. It's important to ask, what makes an opinion probable? To make an opinion probable, a Jesuit finds easy indeed. If a single doctor has pronounced in its favor, although a score of doctors may have condemned it, or if the man can imagine in his own mind something like a tolerable reason for doing the act, the opinion that it is lawful becomes probable. It will be hard to name an act for which a Jesuit authority may not be produced and harder still to find a man whose invention is so poor as not to furnish him with what he deems a good reason for doing what he is inclined to, and therefore it may be pronounced impossible to instance a deed, however manifestly opposed to the light of nature and the law of God, which may not be committed under the shield of the monstrous dogma of probabilism. We are neither indulging in satire nor incurring the charge of false witness-bearing in this picture of Jesuit theology. A person may do what he considers allowable, says Emmanuel Sa of the Society of Jesus, according to a probable opinion, although the contrary may be the more probable one. The opinion of a single grave doctor is all that's requisite. A yet greater doctor, Filiusius of Rome, confirms him in this. It is allowable, says he, to follow the less probable opinion, even though it be the less safe one. That's the common judgment of modern authors. Of two contrary opinions, says Paul Lehman, touching the legality or illegality of any human action, every one may follow in practice or in action that which he should prefer, although he may appear to the agent himself less probable in theory. He adds, a learned person may give contrary advice to different persons according to contrary probable opinions, whilst he still preserves discretion and prudence. End of quote. And we may say with Pascal, these Jesuit casuists give us elbow room at all events. It is and it is not, is the motto of this theology. It's the true lesbian rule which shapes itself according to that which we wish to measure by it. Would we have any action to be sinful? The Jesuit moralist turns this side of the code to us. Would we have it to be lawful? He turns the other side. Right and wrong are put thus in our own power. We can make the same action a sin or a duty, as we please or as we deem it expedient. To steal the property, to slander the character, to violate the chastity, or spill the blood of a fellow creature is most probably wrong, but let us imagine some good to be got by it, and then it is probably right. The Jesuit writers, for the sake of those who are dull of understanding and slow to apprehend the freedom they bring them, have gone into particulars and compiled lists of actions esteemed sinful, unnatural, and abominable by the moral sense, 
of all nations hitherto, but which, in virtue of this new morality, are no longer so. And they have explained how these actions may be safely done, with a minuteness of detail and a luxuriance of illustration, in which it were tedious in some cases, immodest in others, to follow them. One would think that this was license enough. What more can the Jesuit need, or what more can he possibly have, seeing by a little effort of invention he can overleap every human and divine barrier and commit the most horrible crimes on the mightiest possible scale and neither feel remorse of conscience nor fear of punishment? But this unbounded liberty of wickedness did not content the sons of Loyola. They panted for a liberty, if possible, yet more boundless. They wished to be released from the easy condition of imagining some good end for the wickedness they wished to perpetrate and to be free to sin without the trouble of assigning even to themselves any end at all. This they have accomplished by the method of directing the intention and this is a new ethical science unknown to those ages which were not privileged to, to bask in the illuminating rays of the Society of Jesus, and it is as simple as convenient. It is the soul, they argue, that does the act, so far as it is moral or immoral. As regards the body's share in it, neither virtue nor vice can be predicated of it. If, therefore... While the hand is shedding blood, or the tongue is calumniating character or uttering a falsehood, the soul can so abstract itself from what the body is doing as, as to occupy itself the while with some holy theme, or fix its meditation upon some benefit or advantage likely to arise from the deed, which it knows, or at least suspects, the body is at that moment engaged in doing. The soul contracts... <clears throat> neither guilt nor stain, and the man uh, runs no risk of ever being called to account for the murder or theft or calumny or uh, by God or of incurring his displeasure on that ground. We're not satirizing. We're simply stating the morality of the Jesuits. We never, says the father Jesuit in Pascal's letters, suffer such a thing as the formal intention to sin with the sole design of sinning. And if any person whatever should persist in having no other end but evil, in the evil that he does, we break with him at once. Such conduct is diabolical. This holds true without exception of age, sex, or rank. But when the person is not of such a wretched disposition as this, we try to put in practice our method of directing the intention, which simply consists in his proposing to himself as the end of his action, some allowable object. Not that we do not endeavor as far as we can to dissuade men from doing things forbidden, but when we cannot prevent the action, we at least purify the motive and thus correct the viciousness of the means by the goodness of the end. Such is the way in which our fathers of the society have contrived to permit those acts of violence to which men usually resort in vindication of their honor. They have no more to do than to turn off the intention from the desire of vengeance, which is criminal, and to direct it to a desire to defend their honor, which, according to us, is quite warrantable. And in this way our doctors discharge all their duty towards God and towards man. By permitting the action, they they gratify the world, and by purifying the intention, they give satisfaction to the gospel. This is a secret, sir, which was entirely unknown to the ancients. The world is indebted for the discovery entirely to our doctors. You understand it now, I hope, end of quote. Well, let's take a few illustrative cases, but only such as Jesuit casuists themselves have furnished. A military man, says Reginald, uh, may demand satisfaction on the spot from the person who has injured him, not indeed with the intention of rendering evil for evil, but with that of preserving his honor. Uh, Lessius observes that if a man has received a blow on the face, 
he must on no account have a, an intention to avenge himself, but he may lawfully have an intention to avert infamy, and may with that view repel the insult immediately, even at the point of the sword. If your enemy is disposed to injure you, says Escobar, well, you have no right to wish his death by a movement of hatred, though you may to save yourself from harm. And, uh, says Hurtado de Mendoza, we may pray God to visit with speedy death those who are bent on persecuting us, if there is no other way of escaping from it. An incumbent, says Gaspar de Hurtado, may, without any mortal sin, desire the decease of a life renter on his benefice, and a son that of a father, and rejoice when it happens, provided always it is for the sake of the profit that is to accrue from the event and not from personal aversion. Sanchez teaches that it is lawful to kill our adversary in a duel, or even privately, when he intends to deprive us of our honor or property unjustly in a lawsuit or by chicanery and when there is no other way of preserving them. It's equally right to, to kill in a private way a false accuser and his witness, and even the judge who has been bribed to favor them. A most pious assassination, exclaims Pascal. And now chapter 5, the Jesuit teaching on regicide, murder, lying, and theft, and so forth. The three great rules of the Code of the Jesuits, which we have stated in the foregoing chapter, namely, that the end justifies the mean, secondly, that it is safe to do any action, if it be probably right, although it may be more probably wrong, and three, that if no one know to direct the attention the intention aright, there is no deed, be its moral character what it may, which one may not do. It may seem to give a license of acting so immense that to add thereto were an altogether superfluous and indeed an impossible task, but if the liberty with which these three maxims endow the Jesuit cannot be made larger, its particular applications may nevertheless be made more pointed, and the man who holds back from using it in all its extent may be emboldened despite his remaining scruples or the dullness of his intellectual perceptions, to avail himself to the utmost of the advantages it offers for the greater glory of God. He is to be taught, not merely by general rules, but by specific examples, how he may sin and yet not become sinful, how he may break the law but not suffer the penalty. But further, these sons of Loyola are the kings of the world, and the sole heirs of all its wealth, honors, and pleasures, and whatever law, custom, sacred and venerable office, august and august and kingly authority, may stand between them and their rightful lordship over mankind, they are at liberty to throw down and tread into the dust as a vile and accursed thing. The moral maxims of the Jesuits are to be put in force against kings, as well as against peasants. The lawfulness of killing excommunicated, that is, Protestant kings, the Jesuit writers have been at great pains to maintain, and by a great variety of arguments to defend and enforce. The proof is as abundant as it is painful. Chalotais reports to the Parliament of Britannia as the result of his examination of the laws and doctrines of the Jesuits, that on this point there is a complete and startling unanimity in their teaching. By the same logical track to the whole host of Jesuit writers arrive at the same terrible conclusion, the slaughter, namely of the sovereign on whom the Pope has pronounced sentence of deposition. If he shall take meekly his extrusion from power and seek neither to resist nor revenge his being hurled from his throne, his life may be spared. But should he persist in disobedience, says Jalotet, himself a papist and addressing a popish parliament, quote, he may be treated as a tyrant, in which case anybody may kill him. 
such is the course of reasoning established by all authors of the society who have written ex professo on these subjects bellarmine suarez molina mariana santorell all the ultramontanes without exception since the establishment of the society end of quote but have not the writers of this school expressed it in no measured terms their abhorrence of murder have they not loudly exclaimed against the sacrilege of touching him on whom the church's anointing oil has been poured as king in short do they not forbid and condemn the crime of regicide yes this is true but they protest with a warmth that is fitted to awaken suspicion rome can take back her anointing and when she has stripped the monarch of his office he becomes the lawful victim of her consecrated dagger on what grounds the jesuits demand can the killing of one who is no longer a king be called regicide suarez tells us that when a king is deposed he's no longer to be regarded as a king but as a tyrant he therefore loses his authority and from that moment may be lawfully killed nor is the opinion of the jesuit mariana less decided speaking of a prince he says if he should overthrow the religion of the country and introduce a public enemy within the state i shall never consider that man to have done wrong who favoring the public wishes would attempt to kill him it is useful that princes should be made to know that if they oppress the state and become intolerable by their vices and their pollution they hold their lives upon this tenure that to put them to death is not only laudable but a glorious action it is a glorious thing to exterminate this pestilent and mischievous race from the community of men end of quote wherever the jesuits have planted missions opened seminaries and established colleges they've been careful to inculcate these principles in the minds of the youth thus sowing the seeds of future tumults, revolutions, regicides, and wars. These evil fruits have appeared sometimes sooner, sometimes later, but they have never failed to show themselves to the grief of nations and the dismay of kings. John Chattel, who attempted the life of Henry IV, had studied in the College of Clermont, in which the Jesuit Guignard was professor of divinity. <clears throat> in the chamber of the would-be regicide, a manuscript of Guignard was found in which, besides other dangerous articles, that father approved not only of the assassination of Henry III by Clement, but also maintained that the same thing ought to be attempted against Le Bernois, as he called Henry IV, which occasioned the first banishment of the order out of France as a society, the Jesuits, detestable and diabolical. The sentence of the Parliament passed in 1594 ordained that all the priests and scholars of the College of Clermont and others calling themselves the Society of Jesus as being corruptors of youth, disturbers of the public peace, and enemies of the king and state should depart in three days from their house and college and in 15 days out of the whole kingdom. But why should we dwell on those written proofs of the disloyal and murderous principles of the jesuits when their acted deeds bear still more emphatic testimony to the true nature and effects of their principles we have only to look around and on every hand the melancholy monuments of these doctrines meet our afflicted sight to what country of europe shall we turn where we are not able to track the jesuit by his bloody footprints what page of modern history shall we open and not read fresh proofs that the papal doctrine of killing excommunicated kings was not meant to slumber in forgotten tomes, but to be acted out in the living world? We see Henry the Third falling by their dagger. Henry the Fourth perishes by the same consecrated weapon. The King of Portugal dies by their order. The great Prince of Orange is dispatched by their agent, shot down at the door of his own dining room. How many assassins they sent to England to murder Elizabeth, history attests. That she escaped their machinations is one of the marvels of history. Nor is it only the palaces of monarchs 
into which they have crept with their doctrines of murder and assassination, the very sanctuary of their own popes they have defiled with blood. We behold Clement the Fourteen signing the order for the banishment of the Jesuits, and soon thereafter he is overtaken by their vengeance and dies by poison. In the gunpowder plot we see them deliberately planning to destroy at one blow the nobility and gentry of England. To them we owe those civil wars which for so many years drenched with blood the far and fair provinces of France. <clears throat> they laid the train of that crowning horror, the St. Bartholomew Massacre. Philip II and the Jesuits share between them the guilt of the Invincible Armada, which instead of inflicting the measureless ruin and havoc which its authors intended by a most merciful providence became the means of exhausting the treasures and overthrowing the prestige of Spain. What a harvest of plots, tumults, seditions, revolutions, torturings, poisonings, assassinations, regicides, and massacres has Christendom reaped from the seed sown by the Jesuits. Nor can we be sure that we have yet seen the last and greatest of their crimes. We can bestow only the most cursory glance at the teaching of the Jesuits under the other heads of moral duty. Let's take their doctrine of mental reservation. Nothing can be imagined more heinous and at the same time more dangerous. The doctrine of equivocation, says Blackwell, is for the consolation of afflicted Roman Catholics and the instruction of all the godly. It has been of special use to them when residing among infidels and heretics in heathen countries, as China and Malabar. They've professed conformity to the rites and the worship of paganism, while remaining Roman Catholics at heart. And they have taught their converts to venerate their former deities in appearance, on the strength of directing aright the intention, and the pious fraud of concealing a crucifix under their clothes. Equivocation they have carried into civil life as well as into religion. A man may swear, says Sanchez, that he hath not done a thing, though he really have, by understanding within himself that he did it not on such and such a day or uh, before he was born, or by reflecting on some other circumstance of the like nature, and yet the words he shall make use of shall not have a sense implying any such thing. And this is a thing of great convenience on many occasions and is always justifiable when it's necessary or advantageous in anything that concerns a man's health, honor, or estate. Filiusius, in his moral questions, asks, Is it wrong to use equivocation in swearing? I answer first that it is not in itself a sin to use equivocation in swearing. This is the common doctrine after Suarez. Is it perjury or sin to equivocate in a just cause, he further asks? Is it not perjury, he answers? As, for example, in the case of a man who was, who was outwardly made a promise, without the intention of promising, if he is asked whether he has promised, he may deny it, meaning that he has not promised with a binding promise, and thus he may swear. Filiusius asks yet again, with what precaution is equivocation to be used? When we begin, for instance, to say, I swear, we must insert in a subdued tone the mental restriction, that today, and then continue aloud, I have not eaten such a thing, or I swear, then insert, I say, then conclude in the same loud voice, that I have not done this or that thing. For thus the whole speech is most true. What an admirable lesson in the art of speaking the truth to oneself and lying and swearing falsely to everybody else. We shall offer no comment on the teaching of the Jesuits under the head of the Seventh Commandment. The doctrines of the society which relate to chastity are screened from exposure by the very enormity of their turpitude. We pass them as we would the open grave whose putrid breath kills all who inhale it. Let all who value the sweetness of a pure imagination and the joy of a conscience undefiled shun the confessional as they would the chamber in which the plague is shut up or the path in which 
lurks the deadly scorpion. The teaching of the Jesuits, everywhere deadly, is here a poison that consumes flesh and bones and soul. Which precept of the Decalogue is it that the theology of the Jesuits does not set aside? We are commanded to fear the great and dreadful name of the Lord our God. The Jesuit bounty teaches us to blaspheme it. Quote, if one has been hurried by passion into cursing and, and doing despot to his maker, it may be determined that he has only sinned venially, end of quote. Now, this is much, but Kesnetti goes a little farther. Quote, do what your conscience tells you to be good and commanded, end of quote, says this Jesuit. If, through invincible error, you believe lying or blasphemy to be commanded by God, blaspheme. The license given by the Jesuits to regicide we have already seen. Not less ample is the provision their theology makes for the perpetrations of ordinary homicides and murders. Reginald says it is lawful to kill a false witness, seeing otherwise one should be killed by him. The parents who seek to turn their children from the faith, says Fagundes, may justly be killed by them. The Jesuit Amicus teaches that it is lawful for an ecclesiastic or one in a religious order to kill a calumniator when other means of defense are wanting. And Arult extends the same privilege to laymen. If one brings an impeachment before a prince or judge against another, and if that other cannot by any means avert the injury to his character, he may kill him secretly. He fortifies his opinion by the authority of Banes, who gives the same latitude to the right of defense with this slight qualification that the calumniator should first be warned and that he desist from his slander, and if he will not, he should be killed, not openly on account of the scandal, but secretly. Of a like ample kind is the liberty which the Jesuits permit to be taken with the property of one's neighbor. Dishonesty in all its forms they sanction. They encourage cheats, frauds, purloinings, robberies by furnishing men with a ready justification of these misdeeds, and especially by persuading their votaries that if they will only take the trouble of doing them in the way of directing the intention, according to their instructions, they need not fear being called to a reckoning for them hereafter. The Jesuit Emmanuel Sa teaches that it is not a mortal sin to take secretly from him who would give it if he were asked, uh, that it is not theft to take a small thing from a husband or a father, that if one has taken what he doubts to have been his own, that doubt makes it probable that it is safe to keep it, and that if one, from an urgent necessity or without causing much loss, takes wood from another man's pile, he's not obliged to restore it. One who has stole, stolen small things at different times, is not obliged to make restitution until such time as they amount together to a considerable sum. But should the purloiner feel restitution burdensome, it may comfort him to know that some fathers deny it with probability. The case of merchants, whose gains may not be increasing so fast as they could wish, has been kindly considered by the fathers. Francis Tollet says that if a man cannot sell his wine at a fair price, that is, at a fair profit. He may mix a little water with his wine or diminish his measure and sell it for pure wine of full measure. Of course, if it be lawful to mix wine, it's lawful to adulterate all other articles of merchandise or to diminish the weight and go on vending as if the balance were just and the article genuine. Only the trafficker in spurious goods with False balances must be careful not to tell a lie. Or if he should be compelled to equivocate, he must do it in accordance with the rules laid down by the fathers for enabling one to say what is not true without committing falsehood. Domestic servants also have been taken by the fathers under the shield of their casuistry. Should a servant deem his wages not enough, or the food, clothing, and other necessaries uh, uh, provided for him not equal to that which is provided for servants of similar rank in other houses, he may recompense himself by abstracting 
from his master's property as much as shall make his wages commensurate with his services. So has Valerius Reginald decided. It is fair, however, that the pupil be cautioned that this lesson cannot safely be put in practice against his teacher. And the story of John de Alba, related by Pascal, shows that the fathers do not relish these doctrines in praxi nearly so well as in thesi, when they themselves are the sufferers by them. And de Alba was a servant to the fathers in the College of Clermont, in the Rue Saint-Jacques, and thinking that his wages were not equal to his merits, he stole somewhat from his masters to make up the discrepancy, never dreaming that they would make a criminal of him for following their approved rules. However, they threw him into prison on a charge of larceny. He was brought to trial on the 16th of April, 1647. He confessed before the court to having taken some pewter plates maintain that the act was not to be regarded as a theft on the strength of this same doctrine of Father Bounty, which he produced before the judges, with attestation from another of the fathers under whom he had studied these cases of conscience. Whereupon the judge, de Montrouge, gave sentence as follows, quote, that the prisoner should not be acquitted under the writings of these fathers, containing a doctrine so unlawful, pernicious, and contrary to all laws, natural, divine, and human, such as might confound all families and authorize all domestic frauds and infidelities, end of quote. But that the over-faithful disciple, quote, should be whipped before the college gate of Claremont by the common executioner, who at the same time should burn all the writings of those fathers treating of theft and that they should be prohibited to teach any such doctrine again under pain of death, end of quote. But we should swell beyond all reasonable limits our enumeration, were we to quote even a tithe of the moral maxims of the Jesuits. There's not one in the long catalog of sins and crimes which their casuistry does not sanction. Pride, ambition, avarice, luxury, bribery, and a host of vices which we cannot specify, and some of which are too horrible to be mentioned, find in these fathers their patrons and defenders. The alchemists of the Middle Ages boasted that their art enabled them to operate on the essence of things, to change what was vile into what was noble. But the still darker art of the Jesuits acts to the reverse order. It changes all that is noble into all that is vile. Theirs is an accursed alchemy by which they transmute good into evil, virtue into vice. There is no destructive agency with which the world is liable to be visited that penetrates so deep or inflicts so remediless a ruin as the morality of the Jesuits. The tornado sweeps along over the surface of the globe, leaving the earth naked, bare as before tree or shrub beautified it, but the summers of after years reclothe it with verdure and beautify it with flowers and make it smile as sweetly as before. The earthquake overturns the dwelling of man and swallows up the proudest of his cities, but his skill and power survive the shock, and when the destroyer has passed, the architect sets up again the fallen palace and rebuilds the ruined city and the catastrophe is effaced and forgotten in the greater splendor and the more solid strength of the restored structures. Revolution may overturn thrones, abolish laws, and break in pieces the framework of society, but when the fury of faction has spent its rage, order emerges from the chaos, law resumes its supremacy, and the institutions which had been destroyed in the hour of madness are restored in the hour of calm wisdom that succeeds. But the havoc the Jesuit inflicts is irremediable. It has nothing in it, counteractive or restorative. It is only evil. It is not upon the works of man or the institutions of man merely that it puts forth its fearfully destructive power. It is upon man himself. 
It is not the body of man that it strikes like the pestilence. It is the soul. It's not a part, but the whole of man that is consigns to corruption and ruin. Conscience it destroys. Knowledge it extinguishes. The very power of discerning between right and wrong it takes away. and shuts up the man in a prison whence no created agency or influence can set him free. The fall defaced the image of God in which man was made. We say defaced. It did not totally obliterate or extinguish it. Jesuitism, more terrible than the fall, totally effaces from the soul of man the image of God, of the knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness in which man was made. It leaves not a trace. It plucks up by its very roots the moral constitution which God gave to man. The full triumph of Jesuitism would leave nothing spiritual, nothing moral, nothing intellectual, nothing strictly and properly human existing upon the earth. Man, it would change into the animal, impelled by nothing but appetites and passions, and these more fierce and cruel than those of the tiger. Society would become simply a herd of wolves, lawless, ravenous, greedy of each other's blood, perpetually in quest of prey. Even Jesuitism itself would perish, devoured by its own progeny. Our earth at last would be simply a vast sepulcher, moving around the sun in its annual circuit, its bosom as joyless, dreary, and waste as are those silent spaces through which it rolls. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan Hard Drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know, serve, and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.